Okay, here we are again. This is, this is one of the things I love about this kind of research. I bring in these guests, and of course, you've all been knowing that I've been bringing in Mel and Murad. We're going to be soon bringing in another guy named Joe, one of their friends, uh, from three different countries, looking at three different categories and bringing up three different sets of research. And one of the things that I, that I love about these guys is that they're going and they're actually going to the original documents. They're going back to the original time, something we have been saying over and over and over again. Uh, they have dispensed with, they have thrown out the much too late traditions, the ninth and 10th century traditions, and they've come back to the seventh century, and they're going back to the sixth and the fifth and the fourth. In this case, Mel has come up with something new that goes even further back. It goes all the way back to BC. We're going to be going back to the sixth century BC, and we're going to be looking at people like Nabonidus because he has found some new material that now proves to us, or really strongly suggests to us, uh, that this Ramadan fast, the fast that all the Muslims do once a year, that lunar fast called the Psalm is the other name for it, that is not unique to Islam. It has actually been borrowed and it's not borrowed from anybody in the Hijaz, no, nothing from anybody in Arabia. It's been borrowed from much, much further north. But I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to let Mel talk about it. Wait till you see what he's got. And this is these little nuggets, these little nuggets that he keeps bringing forward. These historical antecedents are showing that Islam hasn't made up a thing. It, can't, it is not even creative. It is just borrowing anywhere it can to try to put together this religion. And that's what man-made religions do. They don't, they don't get anything from God. They, they are not creative to do so. When men make up their own religions, they have to borrow right, left, and center. We've seen this with the Quran. Most of the stories have been borrowed. Now we're going to see it even with the five pillars. And here's another one of those pillars, the Ramadan fast. So, Mel, are you there? I am indeed, Jay, and I'm very excited to share what I've got today uh, with you. Yeah, um, <laughs> This is exciting, and this is what I love, because you keep on coming up with these nuggets. You keep on coming up with these little pieces of gold, and they are all fitting to a piece. You can see every one of them brings and shows us that Islam is not new. Isn't that correct, Mel? Absolutely. Um, the great thing about sharing uh, research with, with our audience is that there's always someone out there who's got something extra to add. And, so uh, you didn't a... actually, you didn't actually, what you're going to share now, and I'm going to let you get into the PowerPoint and start yeah. doing that. Actually, this is someone that uh, one of the readers, and remember, we've always said this, those of us, I'm sorry, not the readers, the people who are viewing our videos, those who are watching, do comment, do engage with us. And here's somebody who did engage with you. You're going to introduce him. And he actually said, have you looked at this? Here's something else that actually yeah. fits what you're finding. Go ahead, Mel. I don't want to keep on, yeah. I don't want to keep the, uh, <laughs> the, the thunder from you. You go ahead and tell us yeah. and show us and bring us this PowerPoint so that we can hear yeah. about it. So Wild Woody is a, a viewer that um, said, hey, Mel, have you seen this? And uh, he set me off on a, on a particular direction with the research. I'll just bring up a, a map as we're talking. Um, so while, while Woody mentioned about another link, which was with Haran, and it was interesting because, you know, there was a lot of discussion about the map. And I really, I didn't make too much of the map. The map that we showed, showing Haran in a very central part of the overall world map from the 12th century. I thought that was interesting. I didn't think it was evidence really. It was more a kind of confirmation of the centrality brought, of this we, location. This is what we brought in when we were talking about the word Mecca, the, the, from that 741, yeah. the 8th century reference in the Byzantia da Arabica, uh, where it talks about the word Mecca, and then it comes halfway between Haran and Edessa, and that was that famous quote that Patricia Crona introduced in her book in 1987. And you saw that actually this word itself, this place, was actually right there in Haran. And that was where Ur is. That's where the, that's in southern Turkey. For those who we don't, this is a modern map we're looking at. Am I correct? Yeah, this is straight from uh, Google Earth, and okay, uh, yeah, so so, so um, it, the the place of old Mecca, according to uh, my discoveries, was between Ur and Haran, so somewhere in between. But um, but Haran has got its own tradition, which separate from the whole Abraham thing, which is to do with a moon god, and this is where my research went into. And uh, it's true up a lot of very interesting discoveries, and which I'll share with you now, really. So, Islam got the pre-Islamic Ramadan fast from Haran. This is another interesting discovery that I made, and I'm going to show you the evidence for this. And just to put this into context, um, I've introduced this um, 
six part criteria to just give you an idea how strong the evidence. I would put this as a number five. My theory has got conclusive evidence supported from multiple sources. So this is a very highly supported piece of evidence. Okay, hold, hold on a minute. Let, let's, I, I, this is the first time I've seen this. So what you're saying here, these are different gradations of evidence. So zero is the least going up to five, which is the most. Yeah. So usually um, when I'm starting out looking at um, an idea, it, you know, I may, an idea may occur to me and it's still at a zero because I haven't found any evidence. Other times I might find a tiny bit of evidence, but it's inconclusive, so that might be a one. If I probe into it deeper, I might find corroborating evidence, so that would be a two. Um, and then later it might turn into a cre credible hypothesis. In other words, the, the idea kind of fits together reasonably well. Um, and then hopefully gets to number four, which is a workable theory. Um, it seems to be quite solid. And at that point, I'm trying to disprove it. You might be surprised that I'm trying to disprove my own theories, but that's something that I consider very important. And this is part of why I think the feedback from the audience is really important. Um, it's really important to break the theory if, if possible um, so that we find the truth. So um, yeah, so if it survives a four, it gets on to a five. Now, up to um, about 10 days ago, it was at a four. Um, and then I found some additional um, evidence, which I'm going to show later in the PowerPoint, which brought it up to a five. Um, it's kind of uh, filled, let me see, it completed the circle, let's say, in terms of my evidence gathering. So um, it's what I would consider um, fairly secure, um, verified, etc. So we mentioned in an earlier video that Caleb Marwan II, who who ruled from 744 to 750. He built his palace on the ruined site of the Temple of Sin in Haran. As you can see, it's way up in northern Mesopotamia or southern Turkey, as it would be today. And according to this source from Britannica, uh, Sin or Nana, which in Sumerian, in the Mesopotamian religion, was the god of the moon. Sin was the father of the sun god Shamash, and in some myths of Ishtar, goddess of Venus or Aphrodite, and with them formed an astral triad of deities. And it's interesting that St. John of Damascus links the black stone to a statue of Aphrodite. Now, Nana is also the Sumerian name for the moon god, and it may have originally meant only the full moon, whereas Suin, later contracted to Sen, designated the crescent moon. So essentially, Sen is the one that we're particularly interested in. Now, with that, there was an ancient Hajj-like practice. Each spring, Nana's worshippers reenacted his mythological visit to his father Enlil at Nippur in southern Iraq with a ritual journey, carrying with them the first dairy products of the year. Now, where is the Haran link? The city of Haran was settled around 2000 BC. The site of Haran was a hot, desolate landscape described even in antiquity as a dry, barren wasteland. The Sabians were also located at Haran, not just in southern Iraq or western Persia, as we mentioned on a previous video. Given these conditions, night naturally came to be seen as a welcome relief from the scorching heat of the day. Sun became the enemy, while moon a friend. No wonder that the Haranians built a temple to Sen, a structure that soon became a major landmark. The Sabians didn't really have a concept of week. They had days and they then had months. One of these was Rajab, roughly corresponding to March to April. Now, from the following book, The Knowledge of Life, the Origins and Early History of the Mandaeans and their Relation to the Sabians of the Quran and the Haranians. It's quite a book title. The Sabaeans were divided into two groups, the Mandaeans and the Haranians. The Mandaeans were polytheists that have been living in Iraq since, the second, uh, since 2 AD. The second group, the Haranians, were, were moon worshippers that worshiped the moon god Sen as their main deity along with other deities. And they considered their god greater than the others. 
Well, that's interesting. So you're, what you're getting at is uh, you can now see why the Abbasids, who then are the ones who are introducing this whole idea, that idea of their God being the greater God. You see where this is probably the antecedent to that idea as well, isn't it? Yeah, well, actually, the, the Abbasids ruled from Haran at the very beginning before they eventually moved down to Kufa. So it's interesting that this idea was inherited from, from Haran. Ah, so they took this with them and they took these ideas with them. And as you're saying, also this antecedent looking for the, what you're going to get into, they took this from up north and brought it down to what is today Iraq. Yeah. And, you know, I, just to note, um, it, well, actually it might be later, it's coming up, but the Haranians prayed down towards the south to towards Yemen. So this is obviously significant in terms of the later um, Mecca. We brought this up in an earlier episode. I'll just put the map up here just to remind people. Remember, there's the arrow, that red arrow going straight down south. And where does it go down to? If you take from Adan in the north, it comes straight down to what is today Mecca. Yeah. So Dr. Bayard Dodge, in or on page 78 of his book, The Sabians of Iran, explains that mythological origins of Iran's worship of the moon explained the disappearance of the moon after it joined with the star cluster Pleiades in the zodiac of Taurus. It happened during the third week of March. The people prayed to the moon, pleading for its return to the city of Haran, but the moon refused to return. This is believed to be the explanation for why they fasted during this month. The moon did not promise to return to Haran, but it did promise to return to Deir Kadi, a temple near one of the gates of the city of Haran. The worshippers of Sen went to Deir Kadi after this month to celebrate and to welcome the return of the moon. So as you can see here, we see the origins of Ramadan, which was a 30 day fast. And in the context here, where it came from, we can see the purpose of it. They were fasting during the day, begging for the moon to reappear. So they, they ended the fast when they expected the moon to emerge at night. Um, okay, so what's interesting is they not only have all of these um, elements, but they didn't even bother to change the name much from the original feast. According to the 10th century historian Ibn al-Nadim, the Haranians called the feast al fetr the same name by which the Feast of Islamic Ramadan is called, Feast of Al-Fitr. So you've got the same, you've really got the same word. They really haven't changed it at all. Proving, I think this is a very good proof that this is where it's, the antecedent is going back to. This is where the borrowing came. I mean, that's terrific that you've got, and I would have not thought that it would be the same word, but actually it is really the same word. The pronunciation would be the same. Yeah, and what's interesting is, is the use of the takbirs when Muslims celebrate Eid al-Fitr, the breaking of the fast, they also say numerous takbirs. In other words, Allah is greater. So, that, you know, the takbirs say Allah is greater, but it's, uh, it makes no sense if you believe in monotheism. But in the context of a polytheism, um, you're talking about the moon god is greater than the other gods. So now we see the meaning behind it. So, you know, every this time a Muslim... Every time a Muslim is saying a takbir, they're essentially, they are committing shirk, <laughs> you know? This is fascinating because this, you remember we had an earlier discussion concerning the theological disputes that were happening, that you see in the Quran. There's all these disputes against the, uh, the, the views of the Christians and the views of the Jews and the views of the pagans. That makes no sense unless you're in an environment where there are Jews pagans and Christians that you're having these discussions with. And remember, you brought this up that these discussions that are in the Quran that are theological discussions would only make sense where there were where the, these people actually existed. They didn't there were no Jews living that far south in Mecca Medina for these discussions to take place, but they were living up further in Kufa. You're saying the same thing here as well. This would make no sense. God is greater unless there was also uh, a, a, a there were others to for for him to compete with or against. Yeah. In this case it looks like it's much further north even than than, uh, than what we had, than the Muslims are suggesting down south. Fascinating. Yeah. So if you think about it, the Sabaeans, um, they're found in Haran and they're found, and you know, we use the term Sabaeans and Mandaeans. Um, they're essentially the same group. They're split into two separate groups, but essentially, you know, more generally they are the same group. 
but you find them up in Haran, but you also find, find them way down in southern Iraq and then into Persia. So it's interesting how all of this links up together. Now, so what happened was essentially the Haranian fasting moved in the calendar from Rajab, which is during springtime, to Ramadan in summertime. And Al-Fatr becomes Eid Al-Fitr, which you can hardly notice the difference. Now, how did the practice get embedded into Islam? And this is where it gets really interesting. So this is really the proof that this is true and it's not just a coincidence. Uh, long before Islam, this practice spread from Haran into Arabia through visiting Arabs returning home with these practices. The last king of Babylon, Nabonidus, who reigned from 556 to 539 BC, attempted to elevate Sin to a supreme position within the Pantheon. So he made it his personal mission to spread the cult all the way into Iraq and into Northern Arabia, as we'll see shortly. Many Arabs were in contact with the Sabians and they often went to Northern Iraq where there were many communities of Mandanes and they also went to the city of Haran in the western part of northern Mesopotamia. The pagans of Arabia started practicing Ramadan after it had been introduced to them by the Haranians. The month of Ramadan was called as such because of the warm weather during that month. You can see the sources where this is got from. Nabonidus started proselytizing at Tema in northern Arabia. In time, the last Babylonian king of Iran added more Arabian cities to his kitty, one of them being Yatrib. This later became Al-Medina. With Nabonidus also came the Haranian fasting and Al-Fitr. So he embedded this form of fasting into Arabia long before Islam began, and it's clearly a pagan uh, practice which was devoted to a moon god. Now, medieval historian Ibn al-Nadim documented various pre-Islamic cults of Arabia in his book al farist In it, he writes of various al-Fitr rituals, including animal sacrifices and almsgiving. He also writes of prayers and ab ablutions. According to al-Nadim, pagan Arabs also prayed five times a day, but instead of Mecca, they faced Yemen. So this is another borrowing from the Mandaic religion. By the beginning of the 7th century AD, though, Haranian fasting and al-Fitr were mainstream throughout Arabia, particularly at Medina. And uh, what led us along this path was this post from Wild Woody, who, who I mentioned earlier on. He says, I think Islam came from this region, as did all Abrahamic religions. We have been focusing on the wrong areas. Petra also plays a role in this sin cult. So here's where Petra comes back into the picture again. Okay, I'm gonna stop said, right there. This is great. I'm gonna put a map up right here just to show people what we're talking about. Look at this map there. And can you see where Haran is? Look at where Haran is. It's what, it is what is today Southern Turkey. Now look where Petra is. It's over in the West there in Jordan. So everything that we're talking about does fit to what Dan Gibson's coming up with. It also fits to this notion that you've been bringing up, you and Murad Mel, uh, that almost everything we know about what Islam borrowed from is not from the area it should have borrowed from. It's not from down south. Take a look at where Mecca and Medina are. They're in green there. They're way down in the south. They're hundreds of miles away, 600 miles from, I would say, uh, Petra, but 1,000 to 1,200 miles away from Damascus, and a good another way up in Turkey. I don't even know off the top of my head how many hundreds and hundreds of miles it is away. So this is much, much further north and much, much earlier. I mean, you're going all the way back to the 6th century. So just to put that map there, just so people are aware of what you're talking about, you're not confronting Gibson's material. You're actually supporting it. You guys are both actually coming up from two different directions and showing two different time periods, but two completely different parts of the map, none of them in the south, none of them near Mecca or Medina. Yeah. Um, so the, the wilderness of Sen, which is obviously connected to this god Sen, the moon god, Wilderness of Sen or Desert of Sen is a geographic area mentioned in the Hebrew Bible as lying between Elam and Mount Sinai. Sen does not refer to sinfulness, but is an untranslated word that would translate as the moon. Biblical scholars suspect that the name Sen here refers to the Semitic moon deity Sen. So if 
like if you look at the map just west of Petra is well actually northwest of Petra you essentially find the desert of Sen and below the desert of Sen you find Paran which is a very significant place as well so it's, it all fits really well mm. great stuff excellent so he also goes on to say that uh, remember that Muhammad's only miracle was splitting the moon who else can do that except the moon god Sen in the mind of doubting followers so it's interesting <laughs> that the one miracle associated with Muhammad is that he did something very much connected to the moon god Sen splitting the moon now, for those Very who don't know where this is, this is in chapter 54, verse 1 in the Quran. Now, Muslims today say that he split the moon. If you actually unpack it and look at it in chapter one, uh, chapter 54, verse 1, you will see it is not Muhammad. It's not attributed really to Muhammad. It is really attributed to the last judgment, the end of times that this is going to happen. But nonetheless, uh, you can then understand why the exegetes would have put, uh, would have assumed that this was it, if that is where their background is from, if they're taking it from this uh, moon god sin there that's from up very much further north yeah so you know i'm sure some of our audience will say well a lot of this is hearsay you know it's not very good evidence you haven't offered any solid evidence of the god sin cult in haran to support your claims you haven't shown evidence that nebonitis popularized devotion to sin in arabia so they might say prove us we need at least rock inscriptions from haran so we need to move this on from a, a number four, as we called it earlier on, to a number five. And so here's that evidence. So I got this from an article, a journal called The Haran Inscriptions of Nebonitis, uh, which was written by C.J. Gad. Um, it was written in 1958. Um, so four stella monuments were found in Haran in the foundations of a mosque, which were likely built on the site of an old temple dedicated to the moon god, these had inscriptions on them. With no regard for history, these had been placed face down or part of the paving or steps of the mosque. And it was Dr. D.S. Rice in 1956 who discovered them simply by overturning a stone. And as you can see, the inscriptions are labeled H1A, etc., H1B, and so on. But what's interesting is that there's a great metaphoric um, meaning to all of this that Islam is essentially built on the foundations of paganism. And this here is a perfect example of it, where the foundations of this mosque are on uh, an ancient pagan um, monument to the god Sen. <laughs> and it oh. takes people like Europeans, like Dr. Rice, to overturn them, write them up, to show it to the world. In a sense, that's what you're doing to, as well, Mel. You're going and you're taking a lot of this material that has been covered up, right, covered by the Abbasids and destroyed by many uh, uh, Muslims uh, over the last... 13 to 1400 years and you're bringing it to light again and that's exactly what you do and this is what yeah. the bible says doesn't it say that that if we don't cry out the rocks will cry out for us absolutely so um, they found various uh, sculptures and so on in these uh, stelae but they also found inscriptions which were in cuneiform they were transcribed and and then translated um, they were the inscriptions were by the mother of Nabonitis and by him himself. In other words, they, they obviously told the inscriber to, to put their message on them. So they're very important. And as with all royal inscriptions, they boasted of themselves very much. Um, and so the first one here is from the mother. And she says, I laid hold on, on the hem of the robe of Sen, king of the gods. Notice that Sen is considered the most important of the gods. And she says, towards Ihul Hul, the temple of Sen, which is in Haran, the boat of his heart's delight, he was reconciled. He had regard. Sen, king of the gods, looked upon me, and Namu Naid, my only son, the issue of my womb, to the kingship he called, and the kingship of Sumer and Akkad. I won't read all of it, but you can read it there yourselves. Now, where it becomes interesting, um, in the second one, H2, um, it's now his son who's talking and he basically talks about how he went on a mission into Iraq and into Northern Arabia, spreading the cult of Sen. And uh, let me see if we can, I think it's here. Um, I hide myself afar from my city of Babylon on the road to Tema, Dada Nanu, Padakaku, uh, Hibra, 
Aya Dihu and as far as Aya Tribu. Now, what's interesting here, and he mentions also, um, 10 years I went about among them and to my city Babylon I went on in. At the word of Sen, king of the gods, lord of lords of the gods and goddesses, dwellers of the heavens, they accomplished the word of Sin and Nar, of Samas, Ishtar, Ada, and Nergal. And he talks about the army that was with him. So essentially he's boasting in these inscriptions about how he spread this cult very successfully among the people. And this lasted from, as I say, the sixth century all the way up to the seventh century when Islam began. So sixth century BC, just so people are aware of this, yeah. up until the seventh century AD. So you're talking about uh, you're talking about almost fourteen hundred years. This whole yeah. thing is taking place seven hundred yeah. years before Christ, and another seven hundred years after Christ, or six hundred years after Christ. Yep, yeah, essentially. So, so in conclusion, Islam has co-opted a thirty-day fast and a pagan festival from northern Mesopotamia, Haran. Every part of it references the moon god Sen. Ramadan begins and ends based on lunar sightings, exactly as it was done in Haran. Fasting occurs when the moon is not visible and feasting occurs at night. Saying that the God is the greater, or Allah is the greater, comes straight from the context of a pantheon that calls Sin the greater God. And that's it. As we can see, the, you know, the, the pillars of Islam are collapsing, and this is just another one of the many pillars that we've been um, exposing. Hey, listen, I'm sitting here and I'm getting excited. I'm sure lots of people who are going to be watching this are doing the same. And this is what we have asked to do. And I've asked you to do this, Mel, and I've asked everybody. And that is, when you see the Islamic traditions referring to these five pillars, uh, these again, that these five pillars supposedly existed at the time of Muhammad. They were existed at how when Islam was first uh, was created. Uh, so therefore, in the seventh century is what they're saying. And yet everything we're getting is from the ninth and 10th century. We've always suggested that much of Islam has been borrowed from other sources. And we've seen these. Uh, this has come out in source criticism of the Quran itself, the many different stories, these story after story that you see of the great men of God. Uh, we know them as biblical characters. And yet when you look at their stories, they are nothing more than apocryphal writings. Many of them Jewish apocryphal writings. When you look at the person of Jesus Christ, reference after reference uh, in chapter 19 and in chapter 3, where he makes birds out of clay and th blows them and they fly into the air, when he speaks from the cradle, when he uh, in chapter 19, where he feeds his mother. Uh, this These are not in our Bible, but they are in sectarian references, and then many of these are sectarian references from Gnostic accounts. And now what you're doing, Mel, is you're saying, yes, even the five pillars, when you look at the five pillars, the five pillars are also borrowed. Uh, the, the idea of God himself, the greater God. You brought that out uh, in this talk here. You're talking about the whole Ramadan fast. The, you know, some people know it as the Psalm or the Ramadan. Uh, the Eid al-Fitr. You're looking at the word Fitr and you're saying it's, they, haven't even, they haven't even changed the word. You're keeping the same word. This is the kind of stuff we're looking for. But you're saying this is not from the central part of Arabia that supposedly Muhammad lived in. And we now know that that name Muhammad has antecedents from much further north and west. Uh, this, I'm uh, sorry, east. And this is up near uh, the, what we now know today as Iraq or Kufa or in Baghdad. Uh, but you're now saying also that this fast, this fast that is a lunar fast, comes from a lunar fast because it follows the lunar fast that Nabonidus introduced way back in the 7th century BC, has existed and was then really pushed out throughout his kingdom and throughout his reign by his son and others and went to even as far down as Chaibar. I think Chaibar is what you were looking at there. Isn't that correct? Yeah, the, the, one of the inscriptions, it's spelt as H-I-B-A-R or something to that effect. And actually, some scholars have uh, pointed out that that's a Kaibar. Well, you know no, whether that's correct or not. Yeah. That's in the Northern Arabia. That's where the Jews did live. That's the farthest south the Jews ever got to. Uh, we've seen this from other research that we're doing. So all of this now fits to a historical piece. This idea of a, of a month-long fast, now you said it was in the summertime. That was when it was initiated. Once it became a, associated with the moon god, Sin, that became following the moon god and then became as long as that moon was there. And that's why today it keeps moving itself across the calendar because it's following the lunar god, because it still has that antecedent to the moon god himself. Fascinating. I've, to me, this, uh, th this is just another one of the nails in the coffin that we're now, that we have been uh, nailing away, nailing away, one after another, one after another. 
there is going to be a reaction to this. We're going to get people who are going to dispute with you. I'm sure, Mel, there are going to be others who will agree with you. Uh, I think that people need to be able to react. They need to say what they have, what they're coming up with. Maybe you're not coming to the same conclusion that Mel is, but look what Mel did. He went all the way down to number five, and that's good. I would like what you do that with this, these, these, these different gradients of evidence. Uh, one, that is just speculation. Two, is you come on down to three, four, and then finally proving it because you do have reference. In this case, you had the references on those on the, the stones that had the inscriptions from Nabonidus himself. And so on the bottom of it, you can see where the reference is. If you can't get much better ref, uh, uh, evidence than that, you're actually going to the, uh, the original scriptures written by the original people at that place. You've got the right man at the right time doing the right thing at the right, in the right place. And so that's why it's important that you do try to even critique yourself. And in, in, in response to your own self-criticism, you're saying, well, yes, let's do see where the evidence lies. Now, for the rest of you, you're going to have to respond. Do respond. Come down and write what you think. If you agree with Mel, He'll be watching, he'll be listening, he'll be responding to you. And you can see he has that br bright, iridescent green sneakers corner. That's where you always know that's Mel speaking. That's always Mel uh, looking and he's always supporting his own evidence. And we can go from here. Let's just keep going from here and let's see where we can get going. Look at the map again. Notice the map. Look, and I'm just going to put it up real quickly. Notice what the map shows. We're looking at the red. All of these are too far north to fit the Islamic traditions. And the more we're seeing the Islamic traditions, what we now are seeing is these are all, almost all of them are fraudulent. Why? Because they do not fit with the historical record. Notice that everything that Mel has been doing, and he's even holding himself to a very high standard. Everything that Mel has been doing is historical critical analysis. He wants to make sure that whatever he says he can support with inscriptions, with tablets, with murals, with writings, with even uh, obelisks and stellas, anything that re actually we can look at and date with the names and also date by looking and seeing the events that they talk about. That supports his not just theories anymore. It looks like, Mel, you're going beyond just simple theories. You're saying this is actual proof that something as simple as the Ramadan fast is nothing at all unique. It has been borrowed like everything other. Go ahead, Mel, why don't I give you the last say? Yeah, so it's um, it's going to get worse for uh, for Muslims if they're struggling with what I'm suggesting because the next time I see you, I'm going to be talking about prayer, the most important pillar of Islam, and uh, I've got a few discoveries to reveal with you. So that's something to look forward to. <laughs> he says it's going to get worse. I say it's going to only get, better. get better. I, you call it worse, I call it better, because what we're doing is we're holding Islam accountable to the historical record, the same thing that has been done to Christianity, the same thing that has been done to our Lord Jesus Christ, the same thing that has been done to our Bible, the same thing that has been done to all of us, every religion, whether that is Islam or Hinduism or paganism, in every case, if you're going to make a historical comment, if you're going to make a historical claim, support it with a historical fact. Don't keep coming up with arguments of silence. So far, most everything Muslims have been saying is built on silence. We want something that screams loud from the rocks, if need be, and that's what you're doing here. God bless you, Mel. This is so good to have you on board. It's been great to see all the stuff that you're uncovering. It's been great to see all the research that you're doing, and it's great to realize that you are now really taking on every one of these five pillars. The one Ramadan, I think, was pretty much uh, destroyed today, the next will be the prayers, the salat. Okay, this is Jay and Mel, over and out. Mm -hmm.